today. So hello everybody and thank you for joining us for the fourth webinar in a five-part series exploring the role that media policy can and should play in creating and supporting a strong, sustainable, vibrant local news sector in the United States. My name is Damien Radcliffe and I'm the Carolyn S. Chambers Professor of Journalism at the University of Oregon and a Night News Innovation Fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism, which is hosting this series of events. Last month, our expert panel explored how media policy could better support community and grassroots media organizations. And today we're building on that discussion by exploring fresh models for funding, issues related to digital access to news and information, and the role that nonprofit organizations can play in the local news space. To help us explore this topic, our panel today features three industry and academic experts. Jessica Gonzalez is the co-CEO of Free Press, an attorney and rad racial justice advocate. Jessica advances Free Press's mission of building media and technology that serve truth and justice. Free Press's work in this space includes the new Voices Initiative and Media 2070, two projects that I'm sure we'll hear about later today. Jessica is a former executive vice president and general counsel at the National Hispanic Media Coalition, where she led the policy shop and coordinated campaigns against racist and xenophobic news programming. She's also testified before Congress on multiple occasions on issues ranging from net neutrality and media ownership diversity to affordable internet access. Dr. Christopher Alley is an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia and a fellow Night News Innovation Fellow here at the Tau Center. He's currently leading a research project exploring trust in PBS and how PBS's networks can play a larger role in restoring trust in the media. Chris's latest book, Farm Fresh Broadband, The Politics of Rural Connectivity, unpacks the politics of broadband policy, asking why millions of rural Americans lack broadband access and why the federal government and large providers are not doing more to connect the unconnected. Sue Cross is the executive director and CEO at the Institute for Nonprofit News, a network of more than 350 independent nonprofit news organizations in North America. She joined the Institute in 2015 to build this emerging network and advance social enterprise models for investigative and other public service forms of journalism. Sue is a former senior vice president for the Associated Press Global News Agency, where she created digital news services, expanded Spanish language and Latin American operations, and introduced video to more than a thousand online news sites and managed a national news cooperative. Jessica, Chris and Sue, thank you all for joining us today. So today yes. we thought we'd mix mix up our kind of usual panel format and instead of having a sort of traditional panel discussion, we're going to do three 20 minute deep dives into a different topic introduced by our panelists. We'll hear from them about what the issue is, why it matters and what can indeed is or is not being done about it. Of course, as with uh, all of the webinars in this series, there'll be opportunities for interaction throughout. So please don't be shy about posting your comments and questions in the chat or using the Q&A function. And Nick Matthews, my research assistant on this series and a former reporter and editor at the Houston Chronicle and the Daily Progress in Charlottesville, among other places, and now a PhD student at the University of Minnesota, will help me to keep an eye on your questions and will also help us keep to time. So Jessica, you kindly agreed to uh, start uh, and get the ball rolling for us uh, today. I believe that you're going to talk a little bit about something that's emerged a few times during the course of this series, about the need for a new funding model for local news and how we might go about that. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thanks to the Tau Center as well for putting this series together. It's been really great um, throughout. So Free Press is a, is a nonprofit uh, media advocacy organization and we do believe that media policy can and should play a fundamental role in supporting a strong, sustainable, and vibrant local media center in the United States. And there's kind of two different functions here. There's a, there's a media policy function that mitigates the harms of the existing corporate media structure. And another one that I'll focus a little more on today about rebuilding and restructuring our media system so that it serves the public good. So we see and we know what we don't want, right? In the past decade, over 50% of local newspaper journalists have lost their jobs. Conspiracy theories and bigotry prol proliferate throughout the media. A digital divide uh, is more likely to keep poor people, rural people and people of color offline with less access to local news. Our former president relentlessly attacked the fourth estate uh, the strategy there was to sow chaos and distract from the real issues. And in fact, 
uh, former Trump advisor and white nationalist Steve Bannon even admitted that his strategy was to, quote, flood the zone with shit, a strategy that a global project against hate and extremism report found that authoritarians around the globe have embraced. But yet, as we kind of build the foundation for what we want, it's important to understand that this disinformation ecosystem, this strategy is nothing new. It's deeply embedded in the United States history of oppression. It was a foundational tactic to legitimize slavery, native displacement and genocide, Mexican repatriation, Japanese internment, the border crisis, and every other mass atrocity in US government history. And the antidote, which is why we're here today, is a vibrant, vibrant local media sector. But to build that, we must confront one truth, which is that our corporate media system allows hate and disinformation to run rampant, not because it's good for people, but rather because it's good for business. Corporate media's incentive structures do not serve the public interest in quality news and information that builds bridges. This is why CBS chair, uh, former CBS chair Les Moonves notoriously said, Trump may be bad for America, but he's damn good for us. This is why Facebook, for instance, despite facing two years of widespread criticism, continues to allow haters and liars to proliferate on their platforms, even inciting violence, spreading lies about the pandemic, the election, and so forth. So we definitely deserve something better than this. And, and so free press is fighting for, for three main categories of policy change. One, which I know Chris will get into much more detail on later, so I won't delve into, is or open affordable internet access for all. I'll just say we can't have a free press if only some can access news and information. So we're doing some work in Congress and at the federal agencies to close the digital divide once and for all and to reinstate net neutrality. Two, uh, while it's important that we build a new media ecosystem, in the, in the meantime, we have to play some defense. We need to rein in targeted online bigotry, lies, and surveillance. So it's one thing for individuals to espouse bigotry and conspiracy theories, and yet another for targeted and often foreign-driven hate and disinformation campaigns to target Americans based on our personal and demographic data that the platforms are collecting. So we must defend against these maligned actors by passing comprehensive legislation to protect digital privacy and civil rights. We must oppose unwarranted surveillance. Uh, and, and we're working quite a bit with the Federal Trade Commission on this as well. So, so I'll get to the meat of it now. I know this is what I've really been asked to speak to today is how we rebuild our media system to support the local journalism that we need for a 21st century democracy. Um, this is the portion of Free Press's work where we really focus the most on building this mo me local media sector. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, our, our Media 2070 project uh, really pulls out the history of the media being used to prop up anti-Black racism. Those discriminatory practices run deep. Some still exist today. So the solutions that we're looking at then are not to prop up yesterday's gatekeepers because those really weren't serving us all too well. And certainly that model won't work if the United States is to transition to an equitable and multiracial democracy. The good news is that opportunities abound and we've seen in the past year or two some real momentum and interest in truly figuring out how to sustain local journalism. Uh, the creation of the New Jersey Civic Info Consortium, which is an independent nonprofit organization that funds initiatives to benefit the state's civic life and meet the evolving needs of New Jersey's um, communities, the establishment of journalism commissions in Massachusetts and Illinois, and the introduction of several bills in Congress focused on local news, chief among them the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, show there's momentum to reimagine local news. Uh, as my colleague, Mike Rispoli, who some of you may know, wrote in Neiman Labs last month, we have a chance to use public policies to shape an equitable and sustainable system. But today, greedy media corporations and hedge funds, the very same ones that have contributed so much to the mess we're in, hold most of the political power. 
Recent efforts like Rebuild the News, Rebuild Local News Coalition, which is the main advocacy group for the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, show that journalists are hungry to take action. And that's that's great. We are so psyched for this. But the hard truth, though, is that big commercial media outlets have outsized influence in Washington and in many state capitals, and they are well positioned to advocate for the status quo. We saw this play out with the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, where large companies muscled their way in to a bill that would benefit smaller uh, community publications by providing payroll tax credits for journalists. So as we build future policies to support local news, we have to be aware that they could fall, vic they could fall victim to the same political trade-offs unless we take a different approach. There's a long history of journalists and communities and unions working together to change the media system. And there's a lot of ideas out here, but here are a few key starting points. First, there must be an examination of and reckoning with the history of racist media policies. We've called for an FCC inquiry into this alongside two dozen members of Congress as a foundational step toward media reparations. Second, we must continue to oppose runaway media consolidation, which has led to newsroom layoffs that have reduced local news. Free Press has advocated for a tightening of media ownership limits and other rules that would incentivize local control of media outlets. Third, any policy must center the needs of communities and not the needs of the media industry. In the past, we've seen how media policy is often used to protect incumbent news industry incumbents uphold oppressive systems and fail still to inform the public. And finally, we need policies that move us away from over-reliance on the advertising market. Local news is a truly public good and requires a significant investment of public funding for local media. It's really hard to imagine at this point a future for vibrant local news without innovative public policy and a huge infusion of public dollars to meet community information needs. The losses that we've seen at commercial media outlets, they will never be recouped. There is no amount of reader revenue to give newsrooms the resources they need for the journalism that we so desperately need and philanthropists alone can't fill the gap. One of the ideas we've had at Free Press is to actually tax online platforms, almost like a carbon tax for the, um, for the pollution they've put into our information ecosystem and redistribute that to build truly local, um, diverse news sources in communities, more of a public media model, just much more robust than the one we have today. But for new models to, like this to thrive, we need to organize. We have to have multi-stakeholder people-powered coalitions at local, state, and national levels to win public policies that will create and sustain informed and equitable communities. So I'll stop there. Thank you again so much for having me. I look forward to discussing further. Thank you, Jessica. That was a fantastic overview of both how we've got to where we are and a variety of different issues that we need to address, some of the ways that we can do that. Um, I think, I mean, there's, there's a huge amount that I want to, to dive into, but um, I wonder if we could just start by talking a little bit about um, the where you see the kind of focus right now in terms of energies. Is it is it focused on kind of propping up existing uh, providers and organizations, which is something you obviously be very uh, critical of, and it because it feels as if a lot of the kind of the defense is to uh, maintain the status quo rather than, and this is something that Media 2070 does so well, provide a roadmap to say, okay, where do we actually want to go and what are the steps we need to put in place to make that happen? That's right. I mean, that's why I mentioned how well healed the industry is because that's what we're up against. That's what we saw in the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, which I think started out as a really good concept that was that was truly um, invested in, in incentivizing more local journalists. Um, the industry was able to muscle in and to put provisions in there. So the likes of Rupert Murdoch and the, and the broadcasters that are, if anything, more profitable than ever are, um, 
would benefit from the program and have we'd have no safeguards in place to ensure that that money was actually translating into journalism. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the concern that we have about that model. We actually want, even if it does give, um, money to incumbents. We want some safeguards in place to ensure that money is going to investigative reporting and journalism, not to overhead or to shareholders, right? And that's that's what we need to protect for. But yes, I mean, Media 2070 and um, our journalism policy folks at Free Press are really thinking about reimagining what local news could look like. We have some models that are okay, NPR, uh, PBS, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. There's a model there and there's a lot of good um, that can be done through that model. Uh, Obviously a lot of communities, including communities of color, you know, I come from uh, the Mexican American community has uh, not been shy about its critiques of the lack of diversity, the lack of inclusion um, in in those networks as well. And so, when I say we need to build the media we need for the 21st century democracy, I am talking about race. I am talking about ensuring that we have the systems in place to correctly identify how ra- like how racism is showing up, in, not just in our media system, but in our society. And if we're to move forward and to build a multiracial democracy where people of color become the majority in, 20, in 2050 or so, we really need to start investing in, in a common understanding of, of what the truth is. And especially because, um, you know, I'm a former educator, so I feel like I can say like, part of the disinformation ecosystem is built on a foundation of lies that we learned in, in the public school system. So we actually have a lot of education to do and we have to like reimagine the media system as part of that. I'm not saying the whole thing, but certainly as part of that puzzle. Well, it's pretty damning when you basically describe current providers as okay. Um, and uh, I love how you described earlier on as saying, we deserve something better than this. So where should these energies be focused and how do we support perhaps through your proposals, new entrants, new players, or those who, who are breaking the mold and doing something differently? Yeah, and I want to be—I want to be really clear, Damien. When I'm saying those existing players are okay, I'm talking about those institutions, and not about the journalists within them, because there are so many incredible journalists. They're doing great work, not just in the public media sphere, but in the in the corporate media sphere as well. So this is not meant. I'm not. I'm not hating the players. I'm hating the game here. We have to change the game. The game is not going to work for for the 21st century and so yes we are we are calling on the federal government through the media 2070 project to take a look at at the history of racism in our media system how the government has been a part of that Um, we are working with community to hear what communities want what does the black community want what does the latina what do what do rural communities want right what people who are living in places that have less access to local news. We have local projects in New Jersey, Colorado, North Carolina, <clears throat> and some other places. What do the people want and how do we build from the ground up? What are the information needs that aren't being met? Um, what's filling the void? And that's, that's how we are very centered on building out based on what the people are calling for. And so, yes, that's investment in um, journalists of color, Yes, that's investment um, from the public kitty into um, robust local news systems that don't really exist. I mean, even if you look at NPR, uh, for instance, we have three local NPR stations here in, in LA or, you know, it really, there's a, there's a great disparity between um, how much local news is and information is getting covered station to station. We've lost our beat reporters. We've lost our city hall reporters, education reporters. We're really feeling that I think during the pandemic as well. You know, um, I see it in my local community when as kids are, our kids are going back to school and the parent groups I'm in, people are like struggling to make good choices because we have such limited information. Like even, I'm in a huge county. I'm in the second largest DMA in the United States. But in my local city, 
I have no information about the COVID rates, about the vaccination rates, about the ventilation in our schools. That's the type of reporting that we need to invest in. And we, do, we simply don't have it. No, and I think it was really striking is that's happening in one of the largest media markets uh, in the US, which may su surprise people that we see this in kind of big cities like Los Angeles uh, and New York. This is not just an issue for uh, rural en environs. Um, can you just very briefly uh, tell us a, a little bit about some of the lessons that you've learned from some of those projects in Colorado, uh, New Jersey? What can other states learn from the work that you've been doing doing there? Well, the thing, I mean, we've learned a ton just from hearing from people. We've been so pleasantly surprised by the number of journalists have come to the table like, and, and wanted to just meet with members of the community. Uh, we've learned a lot about the, the pressures that journalists are under, how much they're expected, how much ground they're expected to cover in a really short amount of time. But I would say the thing that um, we're really excited about is what we were able to do in New Jersey. So in New Jersey, uh, we helped um, pass a bill that established the Civic Info Consortium, which is now in its second year of grant making to local, um, to local journalist outlets. And we found that, that the, the way that we were able to sort of muscle up against the incumbents was to work with academics, to work with journalists, and to work with members of the community who really wanted something better. And we learned that public engagement actually does make a difference. You know, like we send a lot of petitions at Free Press. People get tired of them. I get it. But phone calls, petition signing, letter writing, op-eds, and just engagement showing up, you know, in, in, at the legislature, that really allowed us to move the ball across the finish line and build something really different that really didn't exist in any other place. And now we're hearing from other states that are really interested in this model. Uh, we'd like to see more funding um, getting funneled into that consortium so far, the grant, like the grants got bigger this year. So we're excited about that, but we know that we need much more robust investments uh, to really move the needle and get communities the information they need. Thank you, Jessica. So it sounds as if really we're looking at a sort of a nexus of listening more to communities, both by kind of existing journalists, but also other stakeholders in this space, and then a collective groundswell of effective lobbying and messaging to affect change. And I'm sure that's also going to parallel with some of the things that Chris has seen in his research in terms of how communities can get better access to the infrastructure through which so much of the news and information that Jessica has been talking about is is increasingly um, delivered. Um, Chris, uh, we're going to dive into a little bit about some of your work around uh, around around broadband. Uh, I think this is a very timely conversation, given that we're still living through a pandemic, one that's really shone a light on the digital divides that we're seeing um, across the US and the importance of access to digital infrastructure. Um, you know, it's not necessarily it's not a um, uh, it's not a, a, a something that people desire, it's something they need to have to be able to function in uh, today's society. Can you give us a kind of quick overview of some of your research in this space and, and in particular how this links to this kind of bigger theme of access to news and information and quality journalism? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, great to be on this this fabulous panel. So so hi to everybody who's who's watching and listening. And, and, and thank you again to to Damien and Nick and the, and the Tau Center. Um, so, yeah, so my work focuses my, my recent work focuses uh, specifically on the digital divide and how it impacts rural communities. Um, so just a couple of, 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 of statistics and facts to, to get us started here. Um, upwards of 42 million people lack access to a broadband network at home. Upwards of 120 million people lack access to the internet at broadband defined speeds, right? And this is particularly notable, Damien, just like you said, during the pandemic, when, a lot, when people thought they had decent access, but it turned out that when four people in a household were on Zoom simultaneously, their networks could not possibly keep up. And these issues are exacerbated in rural and tribal areas, which often lack the infrastructure period to be able to access. Um, access the internet. And, but I'll also say that um, the digital divide exists everywhere. It is not just a rural issue, but everywhere where we see systemic inequality, the digital divide is present. So this, of course, includes cities, which are often grappling with subpar networks, networks that haven't been updated in decades. 
Um, as I said, rural and tribal communities, uh, the digital divide often manifests as a lack of access entirely. And then of course, for low income households, broadband networks might be present, might be there, but they're not accessible because subscription is too expensive. And, and Damien, like you said, the, the pandemic, I think painfully demonstrated why broadband is essential for everyday life. I mean, this is about work, this is school, this is, this is health, this is civic engagement. Um, the United Nations called the digital divide an issue of life and death during the pandemic. And a really interesting study from the National Economic Research Bureau found that those with high-speed broadband at home are more likely to social distance than those without. Like, and this is significant. This is a matter of life and death, as if we didn't already know beforehand how important broadband was. But I think if there's one thing the pandemic did, it's hopefully stop the conversation around is broadband a luxury or a necessity? I mean, it is a necessity, it is a utility, it is a right. Um, I, I, I write in my book that there are five and now six pillars for, for, why, economic, or for why broadband is so important, um, not only for, for um, rural communities, but, but for every community, you know, economic development, education, healthcare, civic engagement, public safety, and quality of life. And Congress has finally woken up to this issue, and in the infrastructure bill has allocated $65 billion for broadband, $42.5 billion of which will go specifically to deployment, and that's going to be targeted really at those rural and remote um, communities. Uh, 14 billion is also allocated to the uh, to an affordable connectivity program that is going to subsidize broadband monthly subscriptions for low income households at $30 a month. And this is essential because here in the United States, we pay some of the highest prices um, and for quite frankly, oftentimes brutal service among comparable countries. So the average cost of broadband according to the OCI is $84 a month which is bananas, right? Rural communities often pay at least 30% more. And that's, um, and that's when they have service at all. So I argue in my research that, that we need broadband policies and funding programs that looks to our needs, not yesterday and not today, but five or 10 years down the line. And there's gonna be a lot to look out for when these federal broadband programs um, get going, especially for me around, around deployment. Um, so, so Damien, to, to, to the big question here is what does this have to do with local journalism and the revival of local journalism? So I'm going to say, you know, in short, everything. And, and Jessica, I love what you said that we can't have a free press if only some have access. And that, that, is so, that is so absolutely true. And I think, you know, as we're seeing a massive retreat of newspapers in rural areas, um, which has left a, a tremendous number of news deserts, um, you know, uh, Nick, uh, Matthews and I have, have done this work where we've mapped broadband deserts on top of news deserts. And oftentimes these are existing, these kind of devil whammies are, are present in rural communities. So where do people get news and information without an internet connection, a newspaper, a radio station, or a television station, right? And the answer for, for what we found was, was word of mouth. That might be the Dollar General. And it might also be those few people who have internet access, either because they can afford the extreme cost of connectivity in rural areas or because they happen to live within the range of a cell phone. So these people become you know, gatekeepers and informants for local news and information. Um, so so you know, things to look out for, it's, it's, you know, these issues are parallel and oftentimes they're layered on top of each other. Um, and, and the last thing I'm going to add, um, as we continue to watch these new broadband programs that come into existence, is that we need to be very, very careful that history does not repeat itself. And, and um, you know, Jessica and I are totally on the same page here when, when, when Free Press and Jessica is arguing uh, to be very mindful and critical of corporate concentration. Um, in my book, I look at the history of broadband funding and find that overwhelmingly broadband policy and funding programs have favored the largest telecommunications companies who have taken funding and done very little to connect the country. And so I argue um, actually that, that broadband policy has been defined as what I call a politics of good enough. That the whole thing has just been about getting something out there to rural communities and to tribal communities and to low income. Not the best, but good enough. But the pandemic has taught us that, that, that you know, good here is the enemy of great. We need great broadband, affordable broadband for everybody. So we need, some, we need an all hands on deck policy approach that understands that the digital divide is not only going to be solved by big telco and big cable, certainly not, right? They've, they've become failed. Um, but electric cooperatives, telephone cooperatives, local and regional providers, municipal and county networks, and of course, 
states. And this is gonna involve a tremendous amount of, of public funding. Um, and, and the last thing I'm gonna, because I know I'm just, you know, this is my soapbox here, um, is that, you know, I think broadband like journalism is not actually about policy or technology or corporations or markets, it's about people. And if we have a people-centered policy, policy approach, a local policy approach, a community focused policy approach, then we're gonna be so much better off and so much better equipped to make these vital connections. Great, uh, thank you, Chris. You can stay in your soapbox for a little bit uh, longer. <laughs> okay. uh, one, one of the things I, I uh, wanted to explore a little bit was one of the things you've talked about in your book and kind of as you've been promoting that is the importance of local solutions to, to this. So similar to what Jessica was talking about in terms of how can these kind of uh, national broadband policies actually support local providers who are emerging from communities providing those uh, the solutions that those communities need rather than sort of a top-down infrastructural solution yeah um and so we see again the parallel between the the kind of news organization market and the broadband market this massive amount of concentration and and um the lack of community service that happens when we have a policy approach that favors the uh, the largest and the loudest. Um, so I, I argue that local broadband is the best broadband. Um, and that's because these, these local, be it, uh, be they public networks like municipal networks or county networks or from cooperatives or just local providers, see broadband deployment as an investment in the community, right? Rather than demanding that quarterly return on investment um, that a shareholder investor driven uh, company might. So in other words, they're willing to take a much longer return on investment, sometimes upwards of 20 years, because they're seeing it as a community service. So that's one thing, right? There's a there's commitment to the community that is that is found in a local community oriented approach. The other one is accountability. I mean, it matters. It is important when you can run into your broadband provider at the grocery store or at the high school or at church and say, hey, you know, my service has been out. There's going to be more responsiveness there than if you're trying to connect us, you know, a company in, in, in Dallas or Philadelphia and you live 2000 miles away. So that, that local accountability is absolutely vital. And last but not least, these local companies, these community companies, these nonprofits have a proven track record of deploying fiber, fiber field fixed wireless, future proof technologies in the ground, in the air, rather than taking massive amounts of public subsidy and deploying you know, connectivity that's just good enough, right? Upgrading rotting networks um, r rather than, um, you know, trying to trying to use the thresholds as as ceilings to meet rather than floors to build upon. And that's, that is being driven by these local and community organizations rather than rather than the national providers who, who have largely done us a disservice with very little accountability from the policymakers. And, and Chris, within that, are those providers also um, weaving in news and information solutions as part of that mix? So it's one thing to just provide the pipes, but also where's the poetry that comes comes with this? Um, uh, to take a very old uh, policy quote from the from, from the from the UK, um, but you know that's an important part of this mix. That you yes, you can um, build the infrastructure, but that doesn't mean necessarily that then the news providers will come. So how, how is that interplay um, developing? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, you're absolutely right there that, that broadband connectivity in the ground, in the air means nothing unless people actually use it, right? And that just doesn't go for, for, for businesses and news organizations, but it also goes for, you know, everybody, right? It is, you know, it, it's dead weight unless we do something with it. Um, but what we do know on the flip side is that a lack of broadband is a disincentive for a community, right? Um, so I haven't seen, and, and, and this is going to be something really interesting to watch is, is how these, these community focused broadband, uh, uh, providers are acting as news and information anchor institutions. Um, I don't think any of them are actively involved in, in either the production or curation of news and information. Um, but these are pillars in the community oftentimes. Um, they sponsor community events. So they are invested in the welfare of their communities. And I think one thing uh, that particularly in, in, in rural communities that, that I hear a lot is that what broadband does, and this is tangential to news and information, but important is like it keeps or at least attracts young people um, to stay in rural communities, right? I mean, particularly in a time of telework, particularly in a time of a virtual community, we don't, you know, you can live so long as you've got an, a broadband connection, you can live almost every, 
you know, anywhere, as long as you can afford it and it's high quality or what my, what my good colleague, uh, Jonathan Selleck calls high performance broadband. So there are so many opportunities for news and information to flourish uh, when you've got an affordable, high speed, high quality, robust network. And I think that's the really exciting thing to watch as so much of this federal policy money comes down the pipeline is the innovations that can now happen um, be, because of this connectivity. And, and this great quote there's, um, from Bernadine Jocelyn, who's at the Blandon Foundation of Minnesota, and she says, everything is better with better broadband. Um, and, and, you know, this might breed a, a resurgence of rural news and information that has been lacking over the last decade or two. Well, and we also know there's research from Martha Little and others that shows that GDP, you know, income increases as uh, yeah. broadband provision is provided. Um, I'm curious, uh, before we move to Sue, if you could also just say a little bit more about, about how you have found communities are responding to these information. What are some of the solutions that they are putting in place, some of the sort of more lo-fi or kind of traditional methods that, that are uh, having to be utilized because of the absence of digital possibilities? A lot. Um, that's that's a, that's a great question, uh, Damien. And I'm going to draw a lot from the work I did with Nick um, in in one county here in Virginia. Um, so a lot of folks are are getting their news and information from Facebook when they can have a connection. Um, again, the Dollar General uh, in some of these communities ends up being uh, an information uh, wholesaler uh, for for what's going on in the community. But social networking seems to be particularly absent of of a news organization um, or any sort of coverage of the community um, seems to be seems to be absolutely vital. Um, but I, again, I think the thing that I, I worry about here is is we're talking a very small number of people in a lot of these communities who even have connectivity in the first place, and so there's a tremendous amount of data management that goes on. Um, and and so I think we we often take connectivity so much for granted that that we don't think about. You know, does one even have the luxury? You've got, okay, you've got, you know, uh, I don't know, a uh, hundred uh, uh, megabytes that you're able to use in a, in a month or something like that. And, and, and then Facebook even becomes a luxury. Even these, what we would consider lo-fi uh, platforms become a luxury when you're trying to uh, juggle school and, and, um, and work, for instance. And so we need to make it easier because I think if we make it easier on everybody, then we're gonna see different ways of communicating news and information. Um, I really do. I, I don't think it's a naive thing to say. I, I, I really do think we make it easier. We make it more affordable. Um, and, and, and there's so much more opportunity uh, for, for communicating and for the sharing of news and information. Right. And I think one of the things I know that we've seen in, in a, I've certainly seen through my research is examples of people doing things like printing out news stories and pinning them on uh, the notice board in their church or at a bus stop or in a, a library or um, digital outlets putting together kind of print, you know, embarking on reverse publishing because that's the way they can reach um, a, a largest poss larger possible audience. And it, it feels as if, um, I think this is one of the reasons I really want to explore this question was because I'm not sure that this reality that you, heard, you and I are just describing here is one that many policymakers are familiar with. And, and that is fundamental if we're going to res resolve and solve this issue you have to be able to have uh, uh, an innate understanding of how communities are responding to the digital deprivation that they live with as standard absolutely and 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 to put it a different way uh damien we, how do we humanize this policy this policy apparatus right i mean when we're talking about broadband it is it is so technical and so technological that it is so very intimidating, I think, to have these conversations. And then to realize, this is why I say that it's really about people, how these policy decisions are lived or not lived on the ground, right? This is this is absolutely vital. And it even goes down to conversations. One of the big conversations that are going on right now um, in Washington is the very definition of broadband. And I think one of the reasons why we're not we haven't solidified on a much more ambitious forward-looking definition of broadband is because people really do think who have connectivity, well, all connectivity is equal or, you know, connectivity is just good enough. We just give them a Camry and not a Lexus. We don't need gold plated, like, you know, all these, all this terminology when really, you know, a family of four trying to zoom simultaneously cannot have a connection that was defined back in 2015, which is how we're currently defined broadband at 25 megabits per second down, three megabits per second up. We need to think about connectivity, what connectivity is going to look like 10 years, 20 years down the line to set this. Otherwise, the $65 billion that we're about to spend 
from the infrastructure patch is going to be wasted, to be perfectly honest. And 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 that comes with putting a human face on the digital divide rather than a technological face on the digital divide. Great. Uh, thank you, Chris. That's a big warning shot for uh, for everybody there. And I think also one of the things I potentially take away from that is that we shouldn't be defining broadband based on speeds. It's actually about services and what you can do yeah. with that con connectivity and kind of the expectations of this is what a digitally connected household and community should be able right, to do. Right. What does meaningful connectivity look like um, yeah. rather than good enough? Yes, absolutely. Um, let's turn to Sue as our third and uh, final panelist uh, for today. I mentioned when we introduced Chris about how uh, the past couple of years has really kind of shone a light on the importance of, of broadband policy. I think, uh, you know, arguably when we look at your numbers and how your network has grown over the course of the last couple of years, um, it's also shown us the importance of nonprofit news and the nonprofit model. And one of the reasons why I was so keen for you to join us today is that in my most recent Tao uh, research, journalists that responded to uh, a, a survey that I ran um, uh, recently were pretty negative about the future for commercial newspapers and commercial local news. And they overwhelmingly saw the future as nonprofit. So that's a great way to see for you to tell us why they are right. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me and to you and Nick and, and Tao for having this conversation. Um, and for those of you joining in, for taking the interest in it. Um, you know, we've heard a bit about policy and the financing of journalism and these distribution issues. When we talk about nonprofit news, we're really talking about the the raw materials of news, the most fundamental part of it, and that is reporting, going out and getting the information so people in a community can know. And that is what has brought about this tremendous renaissance in um, local journalism, but also national under these nonprofit models and the most critical part of what nonprofits do. Um, it, it might be helpful, I'll give you a, a sense of the lay of the land out there of what's happening and then what's different about nonprofit news. Because if you read a given story, if you're just any one of us, you read a story, you may not be certain if it's produced by a commercial media outlet or a, a nonprofit news outlet, but there are very fundamental differences that are, are spreading. Um, the first thing I'd say is I, I won't talk a lot about the decline of commercial media because I think you've already covered a good bit of that in this series, but the scale of it is profound. It's We've lost 60% of our newspaper journalists in this country in under 20 years and tens of thousands of reporting jobs just during the pandemic. So everyone's seeing this loss of news um, and that's a part of a global market failure. It's not just digital transition, it's not cyclical. This is a long-term change and it's global. So our news outlets have become more like our libraries or our hospitals or our fire departments or roads, you name it. They are a public good. And that's what we mean when we say that. So while this decline is happening though, there has been really the reinvention of journalism using these nonprofit models. Um, my organization formed back in 2009 and it was just a handful, a couple dozen, mostly investigative outlets looking ahead, seeing the trouble coming and saying, we want to save investigative journalism and form this consortium. They were about it when it came to nonprofit news at that time. Today, there are more than 360 newsrooms in our network. What that means is out across the country, there's now more than 2,500 journalists working out of nonprofit newsrooms. That's more journalists than in the whole NPR network, NPR Central and affiliate. It's more journalists than Reuters fields worldwide. So it's we're really hitting this critical mass of a reporting resource for the country. And I call it that a reporting resource because it's a shared resource and that's part of this nonprofit model. Um, the nonprofits share content with each other, but they also are providing it to thousands of other news media during this transition. So you really have in nonprofit newsrooms, the reason they're growing and getting public support and philanthropic support is 
they are maintaining the whole ecosystem and bringing information to a lot of communities that wouldn't have it, both directly and shared. Um, I'm often asked what's different about the nonprofits. And as we said, any given story may not be there. It isn't just a tax status. It's not actually the most significant thing isn't the business model. But if you are um, in the US a 501c3 and a nonprofit, it changes everything. And it's what flows from that. Um, your legal and your financial commitment is to the community you serve and to public service. And that changes the journalism. It's... Um, as both Chris and Jessica alluded, it's much more tied to community needs because it has to form that public service. In commercial models, why do they lead to polarization and this kind of journalism that can be very dividing? It's because they're driven by advertising or algorithms and they tend to drive more profit if they're more divisive in many cases. So. It, you may see many kinds of media out there that are repeating news, but they may not strengthen our communities, strengthen our civic life or our democracy. The nonprofits, because they have a little more space, they don't have to produce that margin. They're not driven by corporate profits. They do have to build community support. So they have to be tied to community needs. They're community driven, um, but they also are transparent and independent they are covering, they're serving the public and stay very oriented to those needs. Um, any money they make, and some do make clear a profit, it's rolled back into the community. It's not skimmed off. Um, and you can see that they have to be transparent in their tax reporting. Um, philanthropic funding of news is also enabling this enormous amount of innovation. And it's not just in big places, it's in small places across the country. We have seen a dozen or more organizations um, launch really new experimental uses of mobile connectivity to both report and to serve the public. For example, we have found uh, digital natives actually creating some innovative types of print products that they may just do once a year, several times a year, but it's different than what we've seen in the past. And so there is this high level of innovation and in sharing the results of that, that then spread throughout the community. It does, the INN members act as a network. They share information continuously and that gives them a stability and sustainability that if they were operating in isolation or operating at for profits, it would be incredibly difficult for them to have. Um, the couple other things that are really different about nonprofit news are um, the communities they serve. You know, the People who are rich will probably always have news. They can pay for highly customized products. They're very attractive to advertisers, but that doesn't necessarily serve our democracy. The community is so affected by every equity issue, education, environment, access to jobs, access to broadband, climate change. Those communities um, may not be the most commercially attractive and nonprofits, 70% of our members have efforts, specific efforts underway to deliberately serve underserved communities. That may be rural communities, it's communities of color, communities that just are not affluent. And so that is a really significant differentiator and an increasingly important one in this nonprofit news world. The, um, the encouraging thing that I'm seeing, and we talked about this growth from 27 to 360. So we're now in our third year, of like 25% growth. Some of that's coming from for-profit newspapers converting to nonprofits. And I think we'll see a bit more of that. We have some public media um, that does reporting. Not all public media has newsrooms, but those that do, we have quite a few members in that. But by and large, what we are seeing that is so exciting mm -hmm. is... Journalists and community leaders go in where there is no news or it's diminished and create something entirely new. And we are seeing that across the country. And then we are seeing these communities and individuals step up and support the news. Um, I'll share just a, a couple interactions we've had lately. Gig Harbor, Washington, I got calls from civic leaders 
They said, we don't have any coverage. How do we hire a journalist? How do we create a newsroom? And we walked them through a lot of that. And they've created something new and it's often launched and Gig Harbor, Washington now has a local newsroom. Um, also a harbor town on the, on the flip side of the country in Maine, um, the Harpswell Anchor was a newspaper. It closed, I think it was about two years ago. And a local group just said, no, we're reviving it as a digital outlet. Um, and they just told me their first year, they had very modest goals. It's a small community. They hope to raise $200,000. We just helped them through this end of year fundraising campaign called Newsmatch. And they raised, the community gave them 350,000, which was far more than they ever expected to get. So you see communities stepping up and saying, yeah, this is possible and we can do this. Um, the, Damien, you had asked me to talk about why it matters so much. I mean, I think those two community examples tell why it matters, but um, there was the story in the last year that I loved the most coming out of this whole community. Our members produce a thousand stories a day. So it's now very robust as a news source. One of them that really stuck with me was out of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, in all the racial equity issues across the country, there's been a lot of coverage of how communities were destroyed by highway projects and public domain projects. And we tend to think about it as in the 60s and the 70s, right? That was back then. And in Memphis, MLK 50, one of our members that covers the black community wrote about an oil pipeline project that was once again going to use eminent domain to go right through a black community. And two, there were a lot of other financial questions about the whole project and the viability. And they wrote and it changed the course of the project. Um, and that reporting was done by a really young reporter, 23 year old guy named um, uh, Cunningham Tatum. And he wrote after that he didn't know that there was still that kind of journalism, that he could make that kind of difference and do that as a young journalist. And that has just so stuck with me. Um, the publisher there wrote about his work and said it's, it's the most poignant example she has seen of the truth uh, of the quote from one of the country's first investigative journalists, who's Ida B. Wells, who wrote, the people must know the truth before they can act, and there's no educator to compare to the press. And so, I, I mean, I think that just sums up everything about why this matters so much. It's how do we support our communities? How do we connect with each other and make decisions in our lives? So, for me, that's why we're doing this. That's why this news field is being reborn. And um, it's hard and it's challenging and it's financially challenging, but it's working and it's really happening on a, on a broad scale. Thank you, Sue. In the time that we have left, I want to try and um, unpack perhaps a couple of misconceptions that people might have about this um, sector. Uh, one of which is the reliance on foundation funding. I think one thing that's really interesting is you've talked about how the organizations that are doing this well are engendering uh, reader revenue, getting donations, philanthropic support from individuals and actually reducing their dependence on kind of large scale grants from foundations. That, that's very correct. Um, I will say philanthropy and foundation philanthropy, I believe will continue to be central in three ways. First, seeding, local giving, and innovation. So these seed funds that get the field started, help them build local support, investigative and highly in-depth expert news. It requires deep investment in reporting. And I don't think reader revenue alone or government support alone or these others will adequately support that kind of uh, deep investigative work. And then again, making sure communities that may not have an individual wealth base for individual contributions, that we get news to everyone in the country, um, not just those that are affluent. So I think philanthropy will continue to play a role in this stable, sustainable ecosystem that's forming. But we do see a profound shift. You know, just a few years ago when Pew was taking a snapshot and Knight was, 
the first nonprofits, the first waves that formed largely around 2008, 2009, they were about 80% foundation funded. It was almost entirely foundation funded. And now foundation funding is under half across the country and our members. So it's down around 47%. And individual giving in the community is now paying for nearly 40% of that reporting. And that to me is so profound that people are stepping up and saying, no, this is my news. I'm investing in it as part of the community. Earned revenue is still a fairly small, and by earned revenue, I mean advertising, some kinds of underwriting, sometimes there's event revenue or fees for training people. That's still running around 15% overall, but it's growing as these news organizations get established. The great majority of our members have three or more revenue streams. So even when they are very small, they are stable. They're building a sustainable path really from the time they launch. And um, this is a difficult question to answer concisely because I imagine there are entire workshops on it. But for those who are who are interested in either launching a nonprofit or uh, transitioning to a nonprofit status, what are the what are the kind of top of mind key most important things that uh, yeah. organizations and individuals need to keep in mind? I'm just going to put out three things and anyone is is welcome to contact us and there are other organizations helping do the same at this point. But there are three things. The first is it needs to be rooted in the community's needs. Journalists and philanthropic funders and civic leaders all tend to have this mental image. They're very devoted. They think they know what the community needs. In many cases, they do. But you need to go out to the community and say, what is that big information gap? What is it you don't know about the local schools or this or that? And then focus on that because news used to be very broad. It's hard to support that. You need to start and meet the most crucial needs and expand from that. Um, the second is to go talk it up and build a wave of supporters. Um, news tends to historically be separate from its communities and there is a continuing importance of independence, editorial independence, that nobody who financially supports the news can shape a story or the coverage. That's fair, but it is in and of the community, whether you define that as a national or local and building those supporters and saying, having just these kind of conversations. Here's what went haywire. Here's what's happening globally. But yeah, you can do something about it. And having that kind of conversation starting there. And then the third thing I'd say is at launch, spend half your resources on figuring out how to build financial support in a business model. That's really hard to do. You want to put it all into the journalism, but it takes experimentation. It takes some hard work. So investing that upfront is really important. Great, thank you, Sue. That's a really uh, great list. Um, I'm conscious that we are almost out of time. So I want to just end with a very quick question for uh, each of you, which is and very difficult, but if if you could see one thing that would make a difference from, the, from your vantage point to building a more sustainable local news sector in the US, what would you like to see? So let's go to uh, Sue first, and then we'll, we'll go in reverse. We'll go to Sue, Chris, and then Jessica. It, it's a great question. And I think we are in the very early days of a big cultural shift. And so it's, uh, it is that helping more of the public understand that this news is a community asset. It's not a business. It's something we support and that can connect us as well as divide us. That's not an economic or a news thing. That's a much bigger cultural uh, shift and it's starting to happen now. Great, thank you, Sue. Chris? Um, well, my, okay, I've, I've, I've got a, a pie in the sky one, which is wouldn't it be great if, if you know, we removed all these, these market imperatives from things like journalism and broadband and, and, and made it all exactly I feel like you said it with with communities and 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 community and grassroots works. I think that's going to be really important. But since you know we're we're not uh, yet at a place to defeat global capitalism, um, I would say you know both for news organizations and and for people like this is from my line of work. This is about affordable high speed broadband. We can get affordable high speed broadband to upstart local journalism organizations. Hell, let's make it free. Right. Let's let's do the same thing for for low income in, individuals, uh, for rural areas, for tribal areas. You know, for everyone should be able to have access to these to these networks. Um, 
to do what it is they want to do. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be so essential for, for the future of uh, local journalism. Great. Thank you, Chris. And the last word to Jessica. Oh, I love the last word. I, I would say the right of the people is paramount. And if we could agree on that and build back from that, we'd be in a lot better place than we are today. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much to our three expert panelists, uh, Jessica Gonzalez, Christopher Ali, and Sue Cross for joining us today. Thank you to everybody uh, who joined us for this discussion. We will be back next Thursday for our fifth and final uh, panel in this series, where we'll be looking ahead to where media policy goes from here, particularly in light of progress or not, uh, that we might be seeing to the legislative agenda on the Hill, the upcoming midterms and elections happening at a state level across the country. Uh, do keep an eye on our social channels and Tao's newsletter for more details and we'll be back at 4 p.m eastern next thursday thanks again to our panelists for joining us today and to everybody for tuning in